Management. This is the third installment of our weekly webinar series, and we hope you find it as beneficial as the previous ones a bit. My name is Chelsea Lukens, and I'm the Marketing Communications Coordinator for iTenant. I'd like to take a moment to explain the process for today's presentation. First, I would like to mention that the webinar will be recorded. Next, I want to let you know that there's been a slight change up in the presentation today, and that Cindy Kincaid will be presenting on Lindsay Tiroli's behalf, though Lindsay authored the presentation material. She has a master's in public health from the Maxwell School at Syracuse University and has a passion for patient outreach and population health. Cynthia Kincaid has been with ITENA for eight years and is the vice president of Client Solutions. Cynthia also has an interest in the population benefits of the benefits of population health and the impact of health care system in the United States. At the end of the presentation, we will open the floor up to questions from you. We will answer all the questions at the end, but you may type them in the questions area of the webinar control panel whenever they occur to you. Finally, for audio clarity purposes, everyone's phone will remain muted through the entire webinar. If you experience audio issues, please use the chat box to let us know so we can resolve them. And again, questions may be entered in the questions box. Cynthia, I'm going to go ahead and pass the webinar off to you. Feel free to get started when you're ready. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation on population health management. As Chelsea mentioned, I'm going to be covering for Lindsay Tiroli today. She authored the presentation, and I hope I do it justice. She was called to a client site, and uh, I think it was very excited about presenting this, so I hope that you will find it as beneficial as we do. As we move forward, our healthcare system today has its challenges. These include a fragmented system based on a sickness model, a high prevalence of chronic conditions, an aging population with an increasing number of chronic conditions, transitioning payer markets, and the need to understand new technologies designed to make treating chronic diseases easier. We may not find the EHRs that we're using today accomplishing that as of yet. However, the increasing need to understand technology is what is going to help us bring non-compliant patients when trying to implement health management programs. We all know that meaningful use and many of the programs that we participate in require the participation of our patients, and that is becoming an increasing challenge. Let's start with a few statistics. 133 million Americans have chronic conditions. One-third of young adults aged 18 to 34 have at least one chronic condition. One-third of adults aged 45 to 65 have at least one chronic condition, and 90% of the elderly have at least one chronic condition. To take that a little bit further, if you look at, I was attending a presentation a few weeks ago on the generation differences and how we are moving through different generations, and we'll talk a little bit about baby boomers. I am a baby boomer. I was born between the years 1946 and 64, and we are extremely high utilizers of health care. This is the largest population in the history of the United States, and approximately 10,000 Americans turn 65 every day. 40.3 million people are age 65 and older in 2010, and by 2050 it's projected to be 88.5 million. Eight in 10 seniors suffer from at least one chronic condition. About 25% of seniors are obese, 20% obese, have diabetes, 70% have heart disease. This is creating uh, an increase of the various types of chronic conditions, so it accounts for the largest percentages of the health care costs in the American system today. These include diabetes congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, asthma, depression, and that's just to name a few. The longer we live, the sicker we get. The cost of chronic conditions is very large to the United States. By 2020, 157 million people are expected to have a chronic condition. 81 million will have multiple chronic conditions. More than 75% of all health care costs are due to chronic conditions. Four of the five most expensive health conditions are chronic conditions, heart disease, cancer, mental disorders, and pulmonary conditions. And by 2023, the top seven chronic conditions will cost the United States $4.2 trillion in treatment costs and lost economic output. The majority of us on this call are participating in the ambulatory market. And over the years, I've watched the ambulatory market change dramatically. It's a transitioning market. We go back, if you've been in the healthcare industry for a while, you've seen that reimbursements are down and that things are shifting to very different types of, of reimbursements. We're shifting away from a volume-based model towards value-based reimbursement models. 
This means the fee for outcome services in rules-based precision care are transitioning away from in-office services towards clinic-like entities such as Walmart, CVS, etc. I can tell you myself, when I, when I first heard of these, I was very hesitant about using them, and now I find it very easy. I've got a sore throat. I run out, do my shopping, stop by, see the nurse practitioner, get a prescription, drop it off at the pharmacy, wait for it to be filled while I finish my shopping. It's a convenient area where patients that are looking to be able to be treated for those day-to-day -day things such as ear infections, sore throats, allergy-based areas are looking to, they know what they have, they know what they need to get done, and they just want someone to do it and get it taken care of quickly. This has resulted in a greater number of nurse practitioner-based practices. In addition to things on the slide, we also have an increase in telemedicine. The Cleveland Clinic is operating the telemedicine clinics throughout Ohio in rural-based areas, making health care more affordable and available and allowing the ability to have nurses treating physicians or nurses treating patients while the physicians are actually participating via a webinar to be able to conduct the exam. This is the direction we're going. The new value-based models focus on quality over quantity. And the most well-known value-based program is Meaningful Use. And I think any of you on this call have always been faced, whether, whether you're a provider or whether you have worked with providers, that they're not able to see as many patients because of the clicks and the things necessary in the EHR. The new models are focusing on quality over quantity and getting the data. In addition, payers and insurance companies are looking to embody value-based reimbursement programs. They want a greater alignment of incentives that includes the consumer, the customer, and the provider. Basically, they're taking the approach that we're all in this together. This has resulted in changing trends. Volume-based reimbursement models already exist in the private market, and it is expected more private insurance companies will implement these type of programs. A study was done in California, 200 physician organizations participating in a statewide pay-for-performance pay program received over $400 million $450 million in incentives through 2012 from the following private payer participants, Aetna, Anthem Blue Cross, Blue Shield of California, Cigna Healthcare of California, HealthNet, United Healthcare, and Western Healthcare Advantage. I can tell you from personal experience with many of my clients in the state of Ohio, which is where I'm from, United Healthcare is becoming very active in pay for performance initiatives, particularly in the areas of OB-GYN and primary care. We've also seen an increase in healthcare networks and changes in healthcare networks. Healthcare networks will be structured to profit from keeping chronically ill patients well. So you're seeing more bundled payments for services, episodes of care treatments, meaningful use, PQRS, CQMs, et cetera, shared savings programs, patient-centered medical home, payer-owned IPAs. This is a new phenomenon that you're seeing more and more, that insurance companies are actually buying provider groups and clinics and then can direct their patients to those type of treatment plans. And per month mem membership programs, capitation is back. Uh, I thought it was gone in the 80s, it's now back and you're seeing it under a different name. The bottom line is it's fundamentally capitation. You have a membership and you're paid whether you no matter how many times you treat the patient. So your best benefit is to keep the patients well. This creates a new role for the provider. Providers will take on the management and oversight of patient behavior intensive diseases. Their compensation will be based on outcomes through population health management, creating a new challenge. I know everyone on this call in all likelihood has either started or thinking about a patient portal, and I've been asked the question many times with the meaningful use measures, how am I supposed to make a patient participate? Well, the bottom line is regardless of whether the patients are compliant or non-compliant, chronically ill or well, the health outcomes will be, will be the basis for your reimbursements. And this is what we have to do and we have to face those challenges. As a result, we need changes in approach. As we look through the shifting market, we must recognize that the patient population is shifting. We have an aging population. We've already discussed that. There is an increase in obesity rates. That is one of the biggest crises in the United States today. We have st stagnant smoking rates. Granted, the smokers are less than they were 10 years ago. However, we're not making any progress, and so smoking continues to be a very, very challenging condition in this country. We have an increase in chronic conditions, and we have an increase in multiple chronic conditions. These trends directly result in greater challenges to manage a patient population in a value-based pay-for-performance world. Basically, people are getting sicker, 
they are not complying, and they're not taking care of themselves, and it, your reimbursements are going down, and we have to find and look for ways that we can actually offset that with new opportunities. Now let's take into consideration the patient factor. We must also recognize that patients are often non-compliant. According to the New England Journal of Medicine, people with chronic conditions only receive 56% of the recommended care they should receive. There is a lack of adherence to the processes involved in care. If you take it specifically, only 52.5% of patients obtain their suggested screening. Only 58.5% of patients receive the recommended follow-up care. If you take a look at some of the things that are happening with patients, and if we can improve the participation by the patient in their own health care, we can make things better. To get more specifics, many of emergency rooms can be avoided. Patients sometimes don't even take their prescriptions. Perhaps they don't have the ability to get their prescriptions. And in many cases, they may be even taking someone else's prescription. In order to overcome the patient factor, we must change our approach. We have to transition from reactive to proactive. We need to increase patient engagement for preventative care. We need to work to prevent patients from falling through the cracks. We need to increase quality reporting for value-based measures. We need to improve return visits, compliance, and patient outcomes. And we need to create target outreach for patients identified as needing additional care to have positive health outcomes. We can do this with population health management, and what exactly does that mean? Population health management is an active approach to proactively manage medical conditions of patient populations with the primary goals to reduce the cost of care while improving outcomes, increase adherence to programs and care plans at a mass level, reduce health care inequalities and disparities. I think everyone knows as we have changed our financial models and we've got different situations and many of the individuals in the country have been uninsured or are moving towards the uh, health care reform system and an increase in Medicaid and Medicare patients as we age, many people don't have the access to health care that they once had. There's also a shortage of physicians moving forward. In order to overcome this, we have to have data, interoperability, and analytics to address specific problems and to mitigate risk at a mass level. We no longer have the ability to do this one patient at a time. And I also think it's important to add a side note that as we move towards this, while we are doing this at a mass level, it's also important to keep the patient in mind. They are the person and the reason that we are all here. We all have EHRs and are working towards this, and what level you are in your implementation, how does the EHR and population health management come together? We might actually finally be seeing how the electronic health record we've all worked so hard to deploy and come up to speed on can benefit us. Electronic health records improves the ability of physicians to be more effectively analyzing their patient population. It gives you the ability of a mass collection of data. You can easily collaborate with multiple healthcare organizations. You can focus on quality improve, improvement metrics. And some of the ways that you do that is you can submit reminders for immunizations and preventive diagnostic studies. You have the ability to configure clinical protocols. It gives you the option to efficiently reach out to patients with health disparities through an automated process. So population health management benefits. The patient benefits. It reduces the frequency of the emergency room visits and hospitalizations. It allows you to lower the cost per service. It improves patient experience, especially with improved access to care. It promotes patient engagement. It empowers the patients through the participation of care plans. I think many of us are recognizing that with the advent of HSAs and some of the participation that, that patients have, they are now going to have to take responsibility for some of their own health care. And by doing this, by utilizing population health, we can help them do that. It provides the ability to monitor patient compliance electronically, such as diabetic patients with high A1C levels, hypertensive patients through blood pressure checks, reminders for preventative screenings, and reminders for flu shots, et cetera. I don't know if any of you on the call have experienced this from your own providers, but I am participating in a patient portal as well as a patient dashboard with two of my different providers, and I received notices about my flu shots. 
I receive notices to follow up on my well exams, I get my lab results, and it's becoming very easy for me to participate in my own care. Many of those portals, including the NextGen portal, have the ability to go on and allow me to look up and generate information on something that I think I may have or ask my provider a question. The benefits to the patients are just huge, and I think it's just now we have to let the patients know about it and help them utilize them. The benefits to the physician are just that. It maximizes the financial return in a value-based care. The bottom line is your reimbursements are going down. We have to be able to make reimbursements higher and quicker, perhaps on more volume, with less interaction. It increases re reimbursement for preventative screenings. Again, many of your HSAs and many of your programs will pay 100% for your preventative screenings while they're paying less and less for the sick visits. It offers shared savings opportunities and it increases patient satisfaction, which again, I think is all why we are here. I'm going to talk a little bit about NextGen Care. NextGen Care was introduced at UGM this year. If you had the opportunity to attend UGM, you might have had an seen part of this in the opening remarks. If there was a presentation on it as well, if not, we do have the NextGen web session downloaded and we can send the PowerPoint out to everyone in addition to sending out this PowerPoint presentation. The reason I mention that is we're not going to talk a lot about the specifics of NextGen Care today. We're going to give a higher level overview and then supplement it with the information that the NextGen video and classes have been added. The first thing about NextGen Care is it's going to be available in UD2, 5.8 UD2, which is available in March. And it really brings together all of the things that I think we've been waiting for. So we'll talk a little bit about it. NextGen Care provides the opportunity to proactively engage with patient population to increase outreach, improve outcomes, and grow ROI. With NextGen Care, you can quickly identify at-risk patient population and take actions efficiently. NextGen Care expands upon the original features of NextGen Population Health. It encompasses data and information from NextGen applications. This would include EHR, practice management, patient portal, dashboard, population health, and NextGen Share. In summary, it basically brings it all together. We had all of these disparate areas of the application that we were using for various stages of our outreach, our reminders, our follow-up. And with NextGen Care, it's now going to bring it all together. NextGen partner, partnered with Milliman, a healthcare actuarial firm with expertise in patient risk to develop NextGen Care in order to easily identify patients with high, medium, or low risk. The major concepts for NextGen Care is that it takes risk stratification for care management and outreach. It shares data with NextGen applications to stratify patient data based on low, medium, or high risk. It's organized to take action effectively and efficiently with an automated outreach feature that can be customized based on patient conditions and stratified demographics. It fully utilizes the population health management tool. It doesn't replace it. It's now an integration, and I think that there was a little bit of confusion about that. So if you have population health management, it's just going to be able to take it to the next level. It's an integrated care management tool. It tracks patients and identifies gaps in care, such as missing immunizations, lack in follow-up care, labs that are due, et cetera. It gives the access to the patient's chart, patient dashboard. You can add recall plans, send messages to the portal, create tasks, refer patients, generate documents to quickly take action when you've identified a particular group of patients that you want to participate in, a, in an outreach program. Its advanced integration with the NextGen Ambulatory Suite basically, as I said earlier, brings everything together and quickly identifies preferred contact methods and the ability to reach out to your patients. This is an example of the patient's dashboard and the risk stratification in quick action. This was pulled from the NextGen presentation and we will be including that for those of you who, who would like a copy of the NextGen presentation in addition to ours. Basically what this tells you is if you're looking at a patient, you can get a list of your patients that have met the criteria. So you can see that we have patients here, Jackson, you know, Bobby Jackson, Tommy Smith, and just a few, few examples. It identifies their risk level, their phone numbers, their date of birth, and the general information. This is basically the, um, 
follow-up list that was created for Brian Guy. So if you take a look at this and you'll see that you have the information, you highlight John Smith. If we move over to the right, you can see the dashboard for John Smith. It tells you immediately where there's gaps of care. The patient has a lipid panel due. The influenza vaccine is due. Depression screening is due. Tdap is due. Then if you take a look, it shows to see their allergies, any problems that the patient may have, medications they're on, and then it tells you their risk level. From this particular screen, you can actually go out, you could chat, send a recall, send a message via the portal, task one of your staff to make a, take an action, create a referral, generate a document, or export out to be delivered to the patient via the portal or to another provider. This is just an example of the kind of information that you can receive once you have this tool in place. As I mentioned, it integrates to next-gen population health and fully brings everything together. There are six major functions associated, care management, risk stratification, patient engagement, referral management, data sharing, and analytics. It targets specific patients for follow-up. It gives you the ability to do risk stratification, which means you can identify at-risk patients. So, for example, if you wanted to know your hypertensive patients over 65 years old who had not had blood pressure check in six months and do not have an appointment in the next two months, you could create a, generate, create a list and send a follow-up associated with that. It also gives you the ability to track outreach and measure performance of programs to identify treatment opportunities. So you can run reports such as expected revenue by appointment type, patient response, patient response time details, the ROI projections by chronic condition. The bottom line is it gives you at a glance and at your fingertips a vast quantity of the data that you've been putting into your EHR for all of this time. In conclusion, there will be challenges in implementing the quality metrics that value-based reimbursement programs create. The new tools could allow for quickly identifying at-risk patients that would reduce reimbursement rates and have negative health outcomes. The automated processes allow providers to quickly and efficiently take care of the most challenging patients. Again, examples, flu shot visits, diabetes management, hypertension management, preventative screenings, cancer screenings, and more. And it gives us the ability of tracking outreach methods that would result in most effective ways to identify mistreatment opportunities. And in the bottom line, it gives us the ability to reach out to all of our patients, whether they're easily served or underserved. This is bringing this whole system together, and frankly, I'm very excited about how this is going to benefit our healthcare system today. I know the presentation didn't take the full hour, but we kind of estimate how these will take and how quickly we move through them. So we have time for questions. and. Also, we'll be able to address any other areas that you might want to discuss or chat about as we move, up, move along with this. Hey, Cindy, it looks like we have a question. Uh, do you have to have the population management program to use NextGen Care, or can it be used as a standalone? I believe, now again, that since it isn't released yet, my understanding is you have to have population health. I also believe that they're going to be sold as a package or brought together as a package based on the the sessions that I attended at UGM on this behalf. We'll give everybody a couple more minutes here to type in um, questions. Again, use the questions panel on the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, looks like we have another one. Do you know when the release date will be? Will it come with UD2? It is with UD2. The release date is scheduled for March. I actually don't have the slide in front of me, and I don't want to pull something up and distract myself, but it's, it's the beginning of March, I believe. Beta is starting in January, and I tend it is going to be having a, a couple of our clients participate in the beta, and hopefully we will be able to get an advanced look at this. Uh, one of the clients in particular is very interested in moving forward with this. Population health is available today, although honestly, I think if you have not implemented it already, it would be a good idea to just wait till it comes out in UD2 so you can get the entire suite. Hey, Cindy, here's another question. Does it provide secure messaging to referring providers if they're not on NextGen? That's going to be with MIRTH. 
And exact, again, since it's not out yet, I haven't been able to actually get my hands on it, but my understanding from the presentations is that the answer to that will be yes, yes, and we will be doing that with MIRTH or NextGen Share. And since it's integrated fully with NextGen Share, whether that's available day one, I am confident the answer to that is going to be yes. That's part of the export function that I, that I mentioned on the dashboard. Do you know if you're going to be able to share images as well? I'm thinking if I heard anything about that. My answer to that is going to, in all likelihood, is going to be yes. It may be associated with a document. I did not see images specifically mentioned, although I did not hear that specific question. At some point, that is going to have to happen. I don't know, again, if that will be day one. The other thing you have to consider with images is sometimes the size and bandwidth that they take. It may be more of a reporting initially and then the transfer of images at a later time. I, I, again, I, I'm giving you my thoughts on it. I don't have a definitive answer on it. Well, while we're waiting, once again, I really appreciate everyone everyone participating. I hope I did the presentation justice. As I said, I didn't, I didn't put the presentation together, although I've worked on it since yesterday when I found that I was going to be covering. I do have a strong feeling for population health, and it's an area that interests me quite a bit. And I hope that everyone on this call will consider the absolute opportunity that this gives us. After all, the work we put into these EHRs and the time we have spent bringing them up to speed and the providers that have, that have demonstrated their ability to move forward with this and put up with some of the things that we've had with 8.3 and some of the challenges, I'm really hoping that the ability to have access to all of this data will bring this full circle and we will see what we have all been working towards. Hey, Cindy, do you know if there's going to be white papers available prior to the March release? Yes, there should be. They're not out now. I will have you know, the, the presentation that NextGen had. I haven't found any white papers yet, but I, the presentation that NextGen had at UGM is an excellent one. And again, anyone who would like a copy of it, if you didn't have the opportunity to attend UGM or if you didn't have the opportunity to see that presentation, we will be happy to share that with you in addition to, the, to a copy of our presentation. They're intertwined quite a bit. Can you think of anything else that you would like to add before um, before we let people go? Give them a few more minutes to type any questions, Cindy. No, I think that I, again, I appreciate everyone. I'm hoping that you'll be happy to get a half thirty minutes back in your day. And as I said, the length of these presentations, we always estimate an hour. I did not anticipate this would take quite that long. However, I am happy to answer any questions or have any discussions with any of you if you would like to just chat about this at some point. My contact information is listed on the screen, as is Lindsay's. And uh, I just appreciate very much your, your attending, and I hope you find these as valuable as we enjoy giving them. And I did just want to mention again that if you want to get a hold of the slide deck, uh, feel free to email Cindy, Cynthia Kincaid there, ckincaid at itenev.com. She'd be happy to give it to you and answer any questions. And it looks like um, somebody informed us that UD2 generally release is 2-27-15. Perfect. Thank you. I knew it was coming February up February 27th. Yes. Thank you very much. I have, I have a little grid on that, and I just didn't have it in front of me. So thank you for sharing that. OK, well, we're going to stay on for a couple more minutes here. If you have any other questions, feel free to type them in, and we'll answer them. Otherwise, as we said, feel free to shoot Cindy an email, and uh, she can answer them then or give her a call. She'd be happy to chat. Thank you for your time today, and hope that you enjoy getting back the extra half hour of your day.